Hey, I'm Eric Brokeach with FitnessBusinessInterviews.com, and I'm here with one of the smartest and coolest guys in the industry, and that is Curtis Mock. And Curtis has built a career and a reputation as being one of the go-to guys when it comes to building a health club or a gym. A whole lot of people turn to him and his business to help him get advice to build their businesses. So I brought Curtis on here, have him come in to tell us a little bit more about himself, how he's built his businesses, and what he can do, and he's going to share a few other tips and help you build your business too. So Curtis, thanks so much for being here, man. I really appreciate it. What's up, Harry? Yeah, it's good to be here. All right, so a little basic information. I kind of want to know who exactly is it that you're doing work for and that you're consulting for and, and what size businesses? Sure. Um, various sizes, uh, primarily gyms, independent mainly. We don't work with any corporates. Uh, you know, we will work with franchises, obviously, because they're... Uh, they're independently owned. They struggle just like a Joe's Gym against the Global Gym, just like anybody else. Um, we have clients ranging from 2,000 square feet uh, on our consulting side up to multiple locations, uh, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 square feet. So, kind of runs the gamut. Okay, now you've become one of those go to guys uh, to help those independent gyms, health club owners. I kind of want to find out how you got there. So. Let's step back a little bit. How'd you get into the industry? Uh, well, my um, my first job was waiting tables, and obviously you don't have any fun waiting tables. Uh, so I immediately got into fitness. Um, in college, I had no idea what I was going to do. I flunked out my freshman year, just absolutely clueless. And then all of a sudden, I realized that. Uh, there's an exercise science degree, and you know, exercise science sounds pretty cool. I like to exercise. I like sports. That sounds like a okay. So it sounds like an easy degree. So I went for it, and then I found myself in a YMCA, and uh, you know, cleaning the gym, uh, helping spot people, and then it just kind of the the love blossomed from there. How long were you doing that for? Like, were you at the YMCA doing that type of thing? Well, you know, they they saw immediately the uh, skill set that I provided, so they weren't having <laughs> things too long. <laughs> No, I, I don't know. I was I was at that that uh, particular YMCA in my hometown of Joplin, Missouri, probably for two years. I was doing the 4:30 a.m. shift, uh, and I know, and I don't even know. I enjoyed it, which is crazy now because I, you know, sometimes I'm up till 4:30. I'm never awake at 4:30. So yeah, work the morning shift, uh, go on to uh, university, uh, and then just do it every day, Monday through Friday, and then every other weekend. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. And how long? Very uh, interesting, how, interesting journey there. How long were you doing that before, before you decided to let me go out, you know, and venture and do my own thing? Sure. Um, pretty limited, you know, when you're going to school, and I just didn't really have that mindset yet. You know, I, I grew up. I uh, wouldn't say I wasn't in poverty, but we didn't have a lot growing up. Um, my dad uh, raised my brother and I. Uh, my mom passed early, and it was just us for a long time um, and then uh, you know now I'm kind of at the point where uh, I just want to provide as much help for these businesses and in turn you know you give and then you get and you know I'm kind of in that situation where my you know, my roots are um, kind of what drive me and, and have me where I am today so Okay, so you were training for how long now? Like, let's say, you know, you said your mindset wasn't right. You were still in school. Mm -hmm. You got out of school. What was the next step after that? And how long were you doing that for? Oh, so you want the the whole? Yeah, oh, yeah. We got to we got to find out how All you right, got yeah, to where you were. Are so. Well, yeah. let's dig in then. Um, yeah, get yourself a soda and uh, some popcorn then. Got it right here. So, man, so YMCA two years. Uh, couldn't do a whole lot when I was going to school. Went and got a personal training certification while I was there. I thought, you know, I want to make money in the fitness business. My dad's hated his job, he's hated his life forever. I'm like, I like fitness, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make money in fitness. And then I realized that, you know, that was, you know, over a decade ago. And they didn't have the people like you or I helping fitness businesses, you know, learn how to make money. So I see that my only opportunities then were to become a personal trainer, which was the only real way that you could work for yourself. You know, I wasn't gonna go out and buy a gym, I just didn't have the, uh, resources to do that. And the only other option would have been to be a uh, wellness coordinator at the YMCA, 
and the lady who had that position, she had it locked locked down. Probably, I, I'm sure she's still there. I mean, she was a career woman in that position. So, you know, you're looking at it, and you know, you can make twenty five thousand dollars a year as a coordinator of wellness at a YMCA. You can go and be a personal trainer, and every personal trainer I saw, you know, even though it looked like they had a pretty good life, they didn't make a lot of money because you know they just they didn't have the business acumen to make it happen. So as I started looking at that, and I'm like, gosh, you know, I like fitness, but just based on where I've been and where I know that I want to go, there just wasn't enough there for me. I didn't know enough about the fitness industry. So I, um, I continued working in gyms, uh, and I went on and I went and got a master's degree in North Carolina, uh, continued working in gyms while I was there. I got a master's in public health, thinking that, you know, well, if exercise isn't going to get me where I want to go, public health, I'll broaden my horizon a little bit. And um, it wasn't what I was hoping it was. You know, I come from the Midwest and where I was uh, there in the South, you know, it was it was a totally different mindset whenever it came to health and wellness. You know, public health where I was is more about surviving than it is about thriving. It's not about exercise and, you know, uh, and, you know, people coming to you and paying you, you know, exorbitant amounts of money to train them and make them better. It was about trying to, you know, we did an intervention, you know, it's really funny thinking about it now. And it was when I realized that I made a mistake in my path at that time was when we ran an intervention and the entire semester was helping single minority mothers of multiple children breastfeed longer so they don't have to depend on the welfare system. How am I going to make a difference in that community? You know, it's just, it just wasn't happening. So, you know, had I gone to one of the schools in the North that I had considered, it might have been different. But as we sit now, I'm pretty glad that it didn't work out because it forced me into remembering that, you know what, this isn't what I like. This isn't the area that I want to be in. I want to be in fitness. And by God, there has to be a way to be financially sound in the fitness industry. So I went back to school. I did a short internship with Health South, and that was a disaster. Uh, and then all the while still working in gyms, I went back to University of Missouri, Mizzou, my, uh, my pride and joy now, uh, and I got an MBA. And, uh, and while I look brilliant on paper, I'm actually not, once you get to know me. And really, for what I do, I mean, you can get away with what I do, doing what I do with a, a high school education. You know, I think that school just more or less taught me how to interact with people uh, and, you know, systems and dedication and, you know, all those feel good things. But as far as schooling, even even a business program, and Mizzou has a great business program, as do, you know, dozens of others, it's just not the same when you're in school versus whenever you come to school. So there's my first tangent. I'm going to go on a lot of them for you. So I'm still working in gyms. Um, I go and I intern at the American College of Sports Medicine in Indianapolis for a summer. And I go to a pub and there's just some random guy standing there. So I decide I don't have any friends. I'll just start talking to this guy. And uh, at the time I was putting together a business plan on how I can go to gyms because by this time I'd worked in gyms, you know, for I don't know, at that time, six years. And I thought, I've got some good skills here. You know, I became a really good salesperson. I wasn't cleaning, you know, the, uh, the gym anymore. I was making pretty decent money as a commissioned salesperson, uh, you know, driving leads in and, and closing deals. But I can probably take my, my game to the streets here. So I start putting together this business plan. I've got smart people around me at ACSM. Um, that gets put on hold. I go back to school. Um, the story with this uh, gentleman that I met in the pub, um, he's actually not a gentleman, he's actually kind of a horrible person, but at the time, you know, he could have been a gentleman. Um, but we're sitting there and, uh, you know, I was like, hey, what are you, uh, uh, he starts talking to me, he's like, well, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm here doing an internship with the American College of Sports Medicine, and you heard of it? And he's like, oh yeah. And uh, he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, you know, once I get out, I'm going to try to build a consulting business and go in and help gyms because I've gotten to where I'm really good at helping gyms. And uh, he kind of smiled and I was like, well, what do you do? And he's like, I run a consulting company helping gyms. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, we start talking a little bit and uh, I do a few things with him at some gyms there in Indianapolis that summer while I'm interning. And um, the way he operated is pretty shady. Uh, if you're familiar with like promotional companies in the in the fitness industry, 
it, it's kind of a smear on the name of the industry right now. You know, it was just a horrible way to take advantage of gym owners back in the day. Now, I saw what he did and I saw how, you know, he took advantage of gym owners and he made money, but he kind of left, you know, bridges burned everywhere he goes. So, you know, I started wrapping my mind around the model that he had and I thought, okay, maybe we can take the integrity that I grew up with and the business model that he has and tweak it to where, you know, we can focus on that repeat business and making people happy and not screwing people over everywhere we go. So um, I take that, my business model kind of becomes what it is. I go back to school, I start working on it a little bit more. Uh, I start doing a little bit more research in, you know, how people consult with gyms, you know, what types of offerings they have, uh, campaign companies, promo companies, consulting companies, uh, management companies, just trying to see what model is perfect, kind of tweak the model, get out of grad school, and immediately I go up to Minnesota uh, with a friend, didn't have a job, didn't have anything, trying to figure out what in the hell I'm going to do. And um, pick up the phone and I call a, a gym there in Minnesota and I said, hey, I will come in there and sell a bunch of memberships for you. Uh, you don't have to pay me anything other than a percentage of what I bring in. Yeah, I'm like, sure, bring it. Let's see what you can do. So I go in there, I kill it. Um, I call in another gym in Minnesota about an hour away, and I say, I'm, I'm kicking ass here. I'd like to come do the same thing for you. What do you think? He's like, absolutely, let's do this. So I go up there, and I absolutely kill it up there. So now I've got some capital. Now I can start doing some things. So I start bringing in some people, bringing in some guys. I'm on the road for three and a half years doing these campaigns where – you know, I pay for the marketing, I drive leads, I beat the streets, they come in, I close a lot of them, and then I take a percentage of what I share with the gym. And um, But the difference between me and some of these other companies at the time was that I wasn't in it for myself. I, you know, I was kind of raised as, you know, you give and then you get. So I always focused on making sure that the uh, uh, I took care of the gyms, and then, you know, it just worked out the way the percentages were that I made money as well turned it into a business and now we've kind of progressed. We don't really do promotional campaigns very often. A few of our clients from four and five years ago, they want to run one every year. So I have some guys that are available to do that. But primarily now we've just kind of turned into uh, consulting and product and, uh, okay. and service. Now, tell me some of the things you were Good doing. Like, yeah. Was, uh, okay. you, um, you called up the gyms, you went to Minnesota and you said, hey, you know, I can sell for you. Were you responsible just for closing deals, or were you also responsible for bringing them new cli new clients and customers? Both. So the idea is that you know it's a done for you service, right? Mm -hmm. So because I'm taking a premium, I'm taking up to thirty five percent of their uh, the the money's generated from that membership. I better be responsible for bringing everything in. I'm not going to ask them to pay for it. So the model was I would pay for all the marketing at the time. I didn't have any money, so it literally was going and knocking on doors and. I mean, I remember like taking the piece of paper that I printed off multiple, you know, day passes and, and whatever motion I'm going to do, and I'm tearing it, you know, at the edge of the table, you know, because I didn't even have a paper cutter. I mean, I'm just like total guerrilla marketing style, uh, just out beating the street. So, and then, you know, once you get the capital in, you reinvest it in the business and then it makes it bigger and better. Right. So, yeah, it always was, I go out, I drive the traffic, and then I sell the, uh, the memberships that come in. And then the gym, oftentimes it was presented to them to where they can do their own thing, but they saw how good I was at doing it. They're just like, you know, 65% uh, of something is better than 100% of nothing. Just mm -hmm. just run. So, and that's pretty much how it ended up working out pretty much everywhere I went. What was the best way for you to bring new clients into the gyms? Interestingly, at the time, whenever we were doing the, um, the campaigns, it was telemarketing, you know, as as hardcore and kind of, you know, shady even that, that 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 word makes you think, it really was just putting somebody on the phone and just running it like, you know, a boiler room, you know, just like get people on the phone and they're calling and they're inviting people in and they want a prize and they got a free month and because they answered the phone, they're the ones that get this special deal mm -hmm. or, you know, working deals with local corporate. Um, Telemarketing was the absolute best way to drive traffic because whenever it comes down to, it doesn't matter how your leads come in, it all depends on the number of leads because it's all a numbers game, right? You have the total number of people you talk to, which gives you the total number of people who come in, and then from that number, or total number of people that call, and the total number of people that come in, and then the total number of people that you close, and the total number of people you follow up with, and then you have this much smaller number of people. So the more people I could touch, 
and start in that process and work them through that funnel, mm-hmm. that's how you get it. So it's just really just absolutely killing yourself out there trying to drive traffic. So but it worked. Okay. And of course, we had the old school lead boxes. And mm-hmm. uh, and then once I started making some money, you know, direct mail does still does a really good job for us because uh, we're really good copywriters and we're really good about putting the right call to action and the headline and everything on on the direct mail. So direct mail normally does for us and our clients a lot better than direct mail would do if you just leave it up to the direct mail company to come up with right. something. So once we started doing that, direct mail did a really good job for us too. Okay, now I take it that the first gym you were at, you didn't automatically set up a telemarketing program for them. You know, there was something else that you, you know, you had to raise some money first. So what were some of the things that you were doing to bring in clients with your first customer? Sure. Interestingly, um, I did start with telemarketing. And, you know, sometimes it's funny, you know, if you force yourself to do something or you invest in something, it forces you to be better at it, you know, instead of just kind of sitting on your laurels. Yeah. Um, so in that case, I literally, whenever we first started, I would, again, it's a numbers game. I would hire 30 telemarketers. All these people would call in. I'd listen to them on the phone. As long as they sounded professional and they could enunciate, you know, at least a few words, then I would invite them in. They would do a one-hour trial. Now, think about it. You know, whenever we did a one-hour trial, everybody knew it. They come in. They get on the phone. They call. They generate leads. If they generate a lot of leads and set up a lot of appointments, I'm going to keep them. Now, I haven't, I'm not paying them yet. So I've got 30 people coming in and working for an hour. So I've got 30 hours of dedicated telemarketers, somebody wanting to impress me so much that they're just killing it on the phone. So anywhere between four and 20 appointments would be set from those 30 people. And then that starts the numbers game there. And then I choose, you know, the three or four that are amazing, and then I hire them. Just like in any business, you hire somebody, it's not like you're going to front them right away, you know? So there's a two-week delay, which with telemarketers, sometimes it's the next day and they're like, can I get a check today? Mm-hmm. No, you can't. You have to wait until the payday. So two weeks later, by that time, all of those leads that they're generating me, you know, in the gym business, you take cash immediately, right? You know, EFT comes later, but you do take down payments, uh, you know, an enrollment fee or first month or last month. So I had money coming in to be able to pay them. So okay. I had the job done first, and then I ended up paying them. But, you know, back, back then, lead boxes were still doing a pretty good job. Uh, depending on how you position them. I would go door to door and work uh, corporate deals and do arrangements where as long as three people from your business join, we'll knock $3 off your, your fee and waive the enrollment fee. You know, it was um, just whatever you could to get in the door anywhere. I mean, I remember we'd set up a table with nothing other than some lead boxes on it and um, a sign that the gym would have. And I would set up a lead box and tell everybody to enter to win a drawing for a $100 grocery card. I hadn't bought the grocery card yet. I didn't have the hundred dollars. I have to sell a membership before I have the money. Wow. So I would, I would wheel and deal. I would make the uh, make things happen, generate the money, and then I'd pay for the marketing and the and the uh, the help afterwards. All right, put you a little bit on the spot. I'm kind of curious because you said you were really good at just you know getting the people come in, but closing the deals. Mm-hmm. Can you give me an example of like if say I came in, I was a lead that you pulled off of a telemarketer coming in. What walk me through your sales process, kind of just so that I would buy your your program. Sure. So we have what is a, a snowflake tour, right? So you come in, you look like a cool guy, you know, you're, you're well-dressed, you don't look like a meathead. Um, my approach to you is going to be much different than if, you know, a meathead or a older woman or a younger couple would come in. So each time I size somebody up, so they come in, we always do a pre-qualification. So no matter how busy I was, no matter whether there were four or five people waiting, I would always do a pre-qualification form. I would make them tell me, you know, their habits, what they want to change, you know, what they don't like about their lives and their health, uh, what they've tried in the past, and then I would be building up ammunition to be able to sell them better. So if you tell me, you know, that, uh, yeah, I eat out, you know, I don't know, four or five times a week. I make a note of that. I've got it on paper. You wrote down that you eat out four to five times a week. So that way, whenever it comes down to a price presentation, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have to worry about it because I already asked you four or five times a week. Are you thinking maybe we can probably cut that back maybe one or two meals? Yeah, I can do that. If you cut back one or two meals a week, how much are you going to save? $10, $15 per week? If I'm selling you a gym membership for $40, you're actually making money by canceling out those two meals. So I size you up based on the way you look, the way you talk to me. And, and the things you put on the, uh, the pre-qualification form. And I also do mirroring and matching. So 
if um, if you're a sweet old lady, I become a sweet little guy. You know, I'm just smoozing. I'm you know touching your shoulder. I'm just a you know. But if it's you, I'm like, oh man, I'm giving you high fives. I'm you know I'm talking right. your talk. I'm walking your walk. So you mirror and match also. So it's all about like you only have a few minutes to really make somebody know you like you and trust you. So you have to do whatever it takes, even if you have to put on just a little bit of an act as a salesperson. And we all have to just part of the game. That's what you have to do. So, and then after we do the pre-qualification, I would um, I would plant some sort of seed in your head. You know, I would say, um, um, well, I'll tell you what, I've got a really cool thing that I'm gonna uh, make happen for you. I'm gonna, I've got a really cool special, but I'm not gonna worry about that now. I just want to make sure you like this. Let's go take a look. So I plant that seed that there is going to be some sort of special. There's something that I'm going to be presenting to you after we take the tour, but we'll come back to that. But it plants it in your in your head, right? So now we're going on the tour, and I'm asking you all kinds of questions that will generate a positive response. I'm getting you to try the equipment, getting you to say, you know, can you feel the burn there? Yeah, I can feel the burn. Uh, pretty cool gym, isn't it? Yeah, it's a pretty cool gym. Um, you know, just whatever I can get them to say yes to. I try to avoid all, all any any question that might get them to say no, because the more yeses that they say, even if it has nothing to do with the sale, the more likely it is for them to say yes whenever you do ask for the sale. So we do the whole tour. Um, every tour is different. I always like to start in the place that they express the most interest. So if you come in and you say, man, I just want to get strong. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm tired of being skinny. I want to get strong. I'm like, all right, we're going straight to the area. Well, now it's a little bit different, but at the time, you know, we weren't talking about core and body weight and exercises, the multi-joint and stuff like that. We were talking about hit the weights. So we go straight to the free weights. I'd be talking about it. I'd introduce you to a guy that's over there that you know, may have been skinny and he also beefed up and talked to you in that area first. Because what happens a lot of times is somebody, a salesperson will take somebody on a tour and they'll do the same tour that they do with you, with the little old lady, with the young couple. Mm -hmm. And it's all good and fine. But if, if I've got weights on my mind, you know, and, and bulking up, or if I'm a, a lady that really loves taking group X classes and I take you everywhere else, you're not even listening to what I say because all you're thinking is, When's it going to show me Group X? I don't care about this. I just want to see Group X. But once I get that out of the way and you see, all right, my curiosity is satisfied, now I can show you all the other value adds that we have that go along with the Group X or that go along with the free weights you have. We'll come back. I'll do one last question that prompts them to say yes. You know, uh, you know, great gym, isn't it? You can picture yourself here, can't you? Yeah, I can. You know, it's nice. And so we'll sit down. We'll, uh, we'll talk about everything we've got. Um, I will show them, I always like three, three options, um, two, no more than three. I always like three um, because whenever we were selling the memberships in a promotional style at a campaign, we needed a certain percentage of down money to be able to pay for the marketing expenses to roll into the next wave of marketing expenses. So we needed the paid in full option. We needed an in-between some type of split option that a few people, maybe about 15% of people would choose. And then we had the full EFT, which approximately 70% of people ended up choosing because it's a lower monthly. So I would present the three, and if I was short on cash, I would lead them toward the first two. I would say, you know, well, you can um, you can pay it all in advance, save a little bit of money. You can uh, pay each month, you know, just a little bit more each month, but that's probably what most people do. Or probably our most popular option right now because it's the perfect blend of the two. You save a little bit of money, and you don't have to worry about the payment each month is our in-between option. That's if I wanted that one. If I wanted them to do the paid in full, I would lead them to the fact that this is a much, much better value for you. The majority of our people go for this one. I say do this one. But did you have a preference? So whatever it is that I need, if the gym needs more cash flow, they need more down money, whatever it is, I can lead them in that, in that certain direction through the sales process. Because by this point, you know, they already know me, like me, trust me. So if I tell them what it is that I feel they should do, they're at the vulnerable state where they're in a really, you know, uh, unusual environment for them. You know, they're in a gym, they're not accustomed to being in a gym, they're trusting me to make sure that I hold their hand and walk them through. So I'm not going to lead them astray, right? So, um, but that's just me. I mean, salespeople lead people astray all the time. Right. But, um, and then I always closed with the same close every time. Did you have a preference? Do you have a preference? Every single time because there's no, you know, there's no yes or no. I'm just simply forcing them to choose one. And I'll even put my finger on the one that I want them to choose whenever I say, do you have a preference? And just hold it there. And then I don't say anything, and then I let them choose. If they have other questions or objections, most of the objections I have you on the pre-qualification form, you've already told me and overcome 
help me overcome any objections that you might have. Um, if you happen to say, you know, oh gosh, that's a, that's a pretty long-term commitment you've got over here. Well, why don't we do the, you know, I have something else in my back pocket. Maybe instead of the 18 month, we do a 12 month commitment. Mm -hmm. Maybe we do a six month. You know, if that's too, uh, yeah, too long a term, we'll go with shorter term. If it's too, uh, too much price, we'll go with the longer term. So there's always wiggle room in there, but you just start with your two or three options, force them to make a decision on that and just shut your mouth. You just literally leave the, the first person you know, I mean, you know sales, the first person to talk loses. So you force them, they're in an uncomfortable situation, they have to make a decision. If you talk, you're giving them just a little bit of time to think and to delay the mm -hmm. choice that they inevitably have to make, that they don't want to make. But if you force them, they're going to make a decision. And the thing about it is, I don't really care. I am, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get them to buy something. Not because I'm a salesperson or I'm money hungry, but really because I've got an overweight person sitting across from me that said that they've been trying to lose weight for the last five years and they put on 80 pounds in the last five years and you know they have diabetes or they you know it's hard for them to get around or you know they're tired of they see their children getting fat you know whatever it is that we have so many problems and they're sitting there telling me all of their problems we pre-qualified and they have tons of problems and now they're saying that I'm not going to give them a chance to say I don't want to do this mm -hmm. because you know you have to make a choice right now so I never feel bad about somebody being a hard sale. I don't even care about, you know, back in the 80s when people were twisting arms behind people's backs and, um, you know, doing used car sales in their approach because really, when it came down to it, being a member of a gym at that small investment is far better than sitting on your couch, eating your Funyuns and watching American Idol. Right. Or, you know, may have been something different. You know, right, now let me, let me ask, ask you this. You went through, that was awesome. You went through a whole presentation. There was a ton of cool things in there. You obviously didn't learn that right from the beginning, but were you a natural salesperson? Did it come easy to you when you first got started, or was it something you really had to work at? Um, yes and no. So everybody has a little bit of salesperson, in them. and I say that because you know you could have somebody that's really really shy, mm -hmm. and somebody that's boisterous and outgoing, but both of them could be equally good salespeople. They just have a totally different approach, you know. So everybody can be a good salesperson. Sales can be taught to anybody. I don't. I think it's more a science and a learned skill than it is an art or something that you're born with. I really do. I think anybody can become a salesperson. You know, I've, I've trained people that should have never, nobody would have ever imagined that they could have been a salesperson. They ended up being an amazing salesperson. And they're not the smarmy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I've got a deal for you today and today only, buddy. You know, we've got the sweet little old lady or the, you know, sweet young girl or the soft spoken guy and everybody can be a good salesperson and it all comes down to a system. So. I read a lot. I read at least a book a week still today. I was reading like crazy back then. I was just taking in all the information that I that I had. You know, there wasn't a lot of information at the time, you know, on how to run a better health club or how to sell health club memberships. So I took it from other industries. Okay. You know, any sales book I could get my hand on, any marketing book I could get my hand on. I was just trying to learn as many processes as I as I possibly could. I even found an old Zig Ziglar. Mm -hmm. um, it was a uh, cassette tape uh, whenever I was cleaning out stuff here a couple of months ago. And yep. Obviously, I don't have anything I can play it in, so it, it ended up hitting the trash. You know, I don't I'm trying not to keep things of nostalgia just to keep them, but it did remind me of back in the day whenever that's all I had was popping a, a tape in the tape player and trying to absorb as much sales material as I possibly could. But, you know, it's you have that aspect of it to get really, really good, but you there's no better way to learn to be a salesperson than to be in the mix, mm -hmm. to to fail a few times, to have somebody correct you, to watch somebody that is really good at it, to just go out there and just do it right away, that's that's pretty tough. Um, and I had a few people, nobody was that great um, whenever I first started doing sales. I ended up being the best salesperson just right out of the gate, uh, I, probably just because I'm a likable guy and I'm honest with people, you know, I just tell it exactly how it is, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I don't come across as a smarmy used car salesman whenever I, I did sales and people just they took me really well so okay and let me ask you there you were doing a lot of sales for memberships for gyms and health clubs were you doing also trying to close people and sell them on personal training packages and options um, in the beginning no um, but then whenever I started this business I just became part of it because okay. you know gyms are notorious for having a horribly organized and uh, personal training department and I mean, a gym would be lucky to have 4% of their total revenues coming from a personal training department right now. It's, it's actually quite sad. So, you know, now we're at the point where we can help people with that 
but at the time, you know, we'd go in and we would at the point of sale upsell, let's say a three session training package for $99 just to, you know, one, get a little bit of money and then two, to introduce them and do some lead gen for their trainers. But at the time, you know, running those campaigns before we got into the consulting stuff, it was purely just numbers, just sell, 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 sell. We didn't worry about their training system, what happened to the people after the fact. We were just there to sell a lot of memberships. And that was the inherent flaw in that promotional model mm -hmm. because we could sell a lot of things. People can know, like, and trust Curtis. But when Curtis leaves and there's 500 new people at a gym, a gym that has horrible systems or no systems with a, a hardly existent personal training department, uh, it just, that's where things started falling through the cracks. So it started out with 500, everything was good and great, and then the attrition was just unbelievable because I can't be there, you know, I can't continue to stay there and do the retention and skills and everything. And, and so I think that's probably what prompted us to get in more on the consulting side of things is because we saw the big gap. Yeah, we can teach somebody to sell or we can give them some marketing strategies to use, but whenever it comes down to it, you have to have the whole package together in order to really maximize the, the time, effort, and money spent on on those things. How long, in the beginning, how long or how much time would you spend working with the gym? A couple months, uh, a week or two, or did it depend on who you were working with? Yeah, you'd, uh, you'd think I'm crazy. In fact, to this day, if I go into a, a hotel or a motel, I kind of get that claustrophobic feeling because I spent three and a half years on the road just going from gym to gym to gym. I didn't have a real address. I used my parents' address until, you know, four years out of grad school because I was building the business. So, I mean, you could go to a location. If it's a small location and, you know, drive in 100, 120 new, new memberships, you could be there three or four weeks. But, you know, I was in a couple of places for six months, you know, so it just, it just really depends. I mean, we're really, for me, it depends on the, the amount of lead gen that's coming in. So if we're in a really good market that's not completely saturated, where people are really responsive to the, uh, to the offer that we're sending out, I'll stay until that, that bell curve goes up and then on its way down. At the moment that we start getting to the point to where we would lose money or not make the amount of money that we're accustomed to, then it's time to start, start moving out. So we would always, you know, try different things throughout, but really it's all about that bell curve. And ours is, you know, it's a little bit different. We go in, we sell a ton of memberships, and then whenever it's done, it's done, and we're out of there. I could never predict, and that was a hard thing managing some of these contractors and consultants on the road is, you know, where's my next spot? When, when am I going to the next spot? You know, this one's going well, but who knows, it could be dead next week. So it's just hard to tell, and then you'd have to have another gym lined up and ready to go because yeah. this contractor is ready to make money. They're hungry, they want to get to the next spot. But if they're going good, uh, the, the campaign is going really well and I've got another gym saying I need somebody pretty soon uh, we're tied up right now it could be next week it could be eight weeks from now that's you know that's that's a broken business model right so mm -hmm. that was a, that was a tough thing inherently in that in that business model when you were yeah. first when you were first starting out was it just you or did you have a partner or two early on no just me um, but soon after you know those two gyms I told you about that I was just really kicking ass at I ended up bringing in um, a buddy of mine, really good salesperson, um, grew up with him. He was in Texas. Um, he lost his job and was kind of down and out for a little bit. I'm like, this guy has some skills. I'm going to bring him up here. So I brought him up. We found him a gym. And then it worked out really well. Well, for about a year and a half until he kind of got you know fat and happy and lazy and just decided he didn't want to work anymore. Nick, if you're watching, I'm still pissed off at you. So... Anyway, he didn't make it, but it, it kind of led me into the, you know, leveraging other people. So I knew I could only do so much. It doesn't matter how good I am. If I can get six other people that are 80% as good as I am, that's much better than me devoting all of my time to, you know, just like in any business. So, um, so yeah, it was uh, me. And um, for that first year, we had three people. And the most I've ever had working with me running those campaigns was nine um, and then now I think there's only, I think there's three, three people that will still go out and do those campaigns occasionally, but they do their own stuff on the side too, just because we're pretty much out of that, that whole business model, just because it, you know, we rode the wave, we caught the wave at the tail end of it. We rode it until we couldn't ride it anymore. And then now we've just moved on to bigger and better things, helping more people. Were they commission based or was it, you know, a salary or wage plus commission? 
all commission, baby. So okay. pretty much since my first job, everything that I've done uh, has been commission based. And really, you know, unless you're my father or my brother or my mother in a small town where there's a job ready for you and you're willing to make $30,000 a year, you shouldn't be in the fitness industry if you're not willing to, you know, work for your money. And we don't have anybody on our staff, with the exception of my assistant, who doesn't earn revenue from at least a portion of their income from percentage or um, yeah, uh, performance-based income. So I'm all about commission. If right. People will sit there and they will just they'll find the easy way to do things, which is not all that bad if the job is getting done. But whenever you do just enough because you you know that you're making your thirty or forty or a hundred thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. well that doesn't cut it. You you've got to earn earn your keep to be a part of my work. Okay. At this point now, how many businesses do you have? Or is it huh. just the one? Oh no, no. Um if you're talking uh just purely legal entities formed for businesses, uh I have six. Okay. But if you're talking about different revenue streams, um, you know, branded separately, some of those fall underneath yeah. those umbrellas. Right. Fifteen or sixteen different revenue streams, and you know that's kind of the the big takeaway and lesson we have with a lot of gyms. Once we get their foundation set up, it's all about the multiple revenue streams. It doesn't matter whether you're a, a, a trainer in a health club, whether you're a boot camp owner, a studio owner, a uh, a big health club. If you're depending on one source of revenue, or if you're depending on boot camp. Uh, uh, membership dues only or membership dues in a health club only you're going to die a very painful death probably a very fast painful death because the world is just changing you, you know if, if one of your revenue streams is is sucking then you better have something that can that can pull it up so I learned early that if, if you're just depending on one revenue stream you're stressed out you're worried about you know what happens to this business and you know if something does happen to it then you've got to start from scratch so the more things you can diversify the more revenue streams uh, you can have the better so I try to practice what I preach in that department okay let's say you go into a club uh, and they only have that one revenue stream just their clients mm -hmm. people coming in memberships what other revenue streams do you suggest you get them going to help you know build that business sure well in a gym it's easy right because they've got the membership uh, and the membership is kind of like a perfect portal. It's a low barrier to entry into their bigger ticket item. So the obvious one that we try to get people started on is a really strong personal training department. Uh, not worrying so much about the, uh, the package deals anymore. You know, the industry has progressed. We're more about the EFT deals now. But there's a lot of gym owners that aren't as, as advanced as, say, a studio owner, and they're still selling packages. They're still selling, you know, their 24-session package for $1,000 and then having to resell that person uh, when all is said and done, rather than getting them signed up on EFT. So we're trying to train and teach uh, some of the old school gym owners the new ways of doing things. But your uh, personal training, you've got your uh, your boot camps, uh, any of the multiple profit centers that they could implement there. I mean, you could you could have a tanning bed that could generate money. You could have your pro shop that could be generating money. You could be selling supplements that's making money. You can do small group. Uh, you can run workshops. You can, you can charge for group X. There's a whole variety of different things. That, that you can do in a, in a fitness business right now. Is there anything that you tried you know, to implement that you thought had really had no shot, you know, something new you were experimenting with that actually took off as another revenue stream for a facility or a club? Um, you know, I can't, I can't really think of anything for them, but um, for our business, we've had quite a few that, you know, we thought, well, this will be a cool little, you know, gap filler, you know, it looks like something that somebody might want. And then we throw it out there and all of a sudden it's just like order after order and you just you end up hitting on something like the um, the gift cards, for example, mm -hmm. that we sell. I thought, you know, people are going in there buying these plastic gift cards from places and a lot of people were actually loading them up, you know, like real gift cards for people to use. And I thought, well, that's pretty silly. We were ordering plastic cards from uh, someplace and... Uh, our clients were also, and I'm like, well, if people are buying these things. Why not create them? I'll sell a few of them, at least to our to our in-house clients. Well, we launched fitness gift cards, you know, I don't know, eight months ago. I mean, we'd sell, you know, 15, 20, you know, just to our core clients, and we sold several hundred of these these packages of, of gift cards. So you just never know. Uh, you know, it, 
every every revenue stream is at least worth a shot. It may may fall on its face, or it may just take off and, and go. But the the issue is, you know, a lot of gyms don't follow the the Goya. You know what Goya is? No, get off your ass. So it all comes down to actually doing something. So I mean, talk is cheap, right? Especially in our industry. And you know, if you're as scatterbrained as I am, I mean, you go from project to project to project to idea to idea to idea. And then sometimes if you don't stop long enough to get off your ass and implement something, nothing is ever going to happen. So a lot of times that's all it comes down to. It doesn't matter if you have an idea that you think might generate revenue, it probably will. You just have to get the plan in place and then implement it. Okay, now I want to ask you, because I know you do have partners for the businesses, I want to know what is it that makes the partnerships work and you know how do you manage that and is there any friction sometimes and how do you deal with that within the business? Sure. Um, I do have partners. Um, in the beginning, I was, I wouldn't say I was selfish. I was just really protective of the business. But, you know, it gets to a point. And my point was about three and a half years ago where I was doing everything myself. You know, I was still, I had come off campaigns. I still had guys out running the campaigns. But now I was trying to build a consulting business and have some other products and services. And I just saw the bigger picture. You know, I stepped out long enough. Like, there's more than just traveling from hotel to hotel, helping a gym generate money. Because that's, I mean, it's fun when you're young and you know you going out traveling. But at some point, you have different dreams. And my dream was to start building a, a mini empire here. You know, to offer all kinds of products and services for lots of different people. And I couldn't do it if I was constantly working in the business. I mean, you know, the you know you should work on your business instead of in your business. You know, everybody knows that. Well, I wasn't living it at the time. You know, I was working in my business. I was very close to it. I was doing everything. And one day, I just like realized that. I can't do this by myself anymore, not if I want to get to the level that I want to get to. So um, all of the partners that I have currently, um, with the exception of maybe two, came through my ranks. Uh, they've worked with me for me, uh, they've proven themselves, and they've earned a spot. So now they get put in a position to where they can take this business entity and grow it with my guidance. And then somebody else, they prove themselves, and then um, I hand off this business entity and allow them to grow it, and then I guide the process and you know earn on the backside and assist whenever whenever needed. So, right. of course, there is always friction, and you know, whenever you hire from the inside like I have, you become friends with these guys. You know, when you're self-employed and you work in either from your home or you work from a small office suite like we do, we only have four people in our office. Man, I mean. You put, you know, several people in an enclosed area without some sort of outlet, and eventually something isn't going to work, or you start, you know, right. finding issues everywhere. So there is a definite delicate balance that you have to have, you know, because I look at things, and I remember when I was doing everything, and you know, I'm a perfectionist. I want everything perfect, and when somebody else does a job for me, it's never going to be perfect. It might be perfect, but like the standards that I set and the expectations that I have, it's never there. And you know, when you own a business and you have other people that you're leveraging to do things, partners or employees, contractors, it doesn't matter, you have to understand and, and accept the fact that nobody is going to do it as well as you are. But you can't do everything. So it's better to have 80% of Curtis, 80% of Eric, than 100% of Curtis in one spot. 80% of me all over the place is much better. Right. Helps more people, generates more revenue. So, yeah, you just—it's just a balancing act. You know, the being an entrepreneur is just a—it's a game. You know, it's always finding new ways to generate revenue, build relationships, and keep everything uh, working smoothly on the inside. Okay, now you have your partners; they're doing, you know, working in the business, helping you out. Do you outsource anything? Oh yeah, um, a lot. So um, we outsource overseas, and then we outsource some here in the states. It just depends on what the project is. So. Um, you know, I've had my run with, you know, like the Elance and the Guru and hiring, you know, people in India and the Philippines for various things, one-offs and sometimes continuous projects. But it gets pretty old because, you know, even though the out idea of outsourcing is attractive, one, it's, you know, it costs you a, a third or a fourth the cost to outsource overseas. And trust me, I'm all about keeping it in the USA. But my way of doing that is I can outsource save that money and it gives me more expendable income to dump into the US economy so that's the way I get to contribute so I outsource uh, overseas on some things that are you know mindless menial menial things 
uh, graphic design sometimes, um, uh, various other things. But then I have some people like our web guy and our programmers, they're in the States. Just There's just certain things that when it comes to me being as meticulous and detail oriented as I am, but lacking the skills of design, I have no artistic ability whatsoever. They do, but it it's a challenge sometimes to communicate, mm -hmm. especially whenever they don't speak English as their native language. So yeah. there's some people that I just keep on my team on retainer uh, and for one-off things that are here. But yeah, all of our web stuff, all of our graphic design, uh, fulfillment, um, gosh, voiceovers for videos, animations, mm -hmm. uh, video editing, all, all of those things are all outsourced. We don't do anything uh, internally. We try, to, we try to keep most of the core uh, activities in in house and then outsource the things that you know are not our core competency about outside. Okay, one of the things I noticed is at least early on you were traveling, you were doing, you were going to everybody you know to help them. A lot of the other consultants in the industry have people coming to them instead of traveling. Are you still focusing mm -hmm. on you know sending your partners or employees out to those businesses to help them, or do you now have people coming to you? Um, you know, the world. And the way technology is now, we're a pretty connected world just through phone and now with the World Wide Web. I mean, when five years ago, could you and I have been sitting side by side on this video screen entertaining these folks? It just doesn't happen. I mean, the, the way the world has just changed, you know, it's not the Pony Express. You don't always have to go to to deliver whatever it is that you're delivering. They don't always have to come to you. You know, we have so many different mediums that allow us to consult with our clients from afar and still get the maximum benefit from it. And it's so much more cost effective for them too. I mean, if you think about, you know, if if I were to hire you to come here and consult with me, you're going to charge me. Well, you'll probably charge me hundreds of thousands, but normal people would charge, you know, thousands of dollars versus hundreds if mm -hmm. if I can help you via online. So if you can get 80% of the effect for 20% of the cost. That's a much better ratio in my mind. So we do still, like I said, we have a few guys that will go out and run campaigns for long-term clients that just really like to have that shot in the arm once or twice a year. Um, we'll sometimes go out, we have what's called a Fit Foundation, where we'll go on site for a couple of days. Our, our primary consultants will do that from time to time. Doesn't happen very often, maybe twice per quarter. So you know, maybe once every other month or so, um, they'll have one of those assign assignments, but primarily, we sit put and then we just feed them as much information and know-how and done for you systems and services okay. as possible from one. But it's very valuable. I mean, if I could be everywhere, if you could just teleport yeah. me right now to the gym, I would absolutely kill it for them, right? So you can't do that. Technology is not there yet. Whenever right. you invent that, we'll be, we'll be good to go. We'll make a lot of money transporting and consulting. Okay. Now, I also noticed that uh, this is a random question. You do some work overseas in Australia. Mm -hmm. How did you end up getting over there, you know, not just in the U.S. and in other parts of the world to do your business? Uh, we took a plane, actually, Eric. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, we, uh, that's a good question. How did we get hooked up in Australia? Um, I have to give a shout out to uh, Amanda Brax, one of my good friends and uh, our partner there um, in Australia. I think what started it, um, whenever I bought... I wanted the domain fitbiz.tv for the TV show. I just thought it was catchy, it was short, it was, you know, the .tv was kind of big in the, the web TV world, and that's just what I wanted. And somebody had it in the fitness industry, and he was in New Zealand. And so I made an offer to him, uh, we negotiated, I bought the domain name, and during conversations, we started talking about the possibility of going over there and running some type of workshop, you know, and the, the health club owners over there, they're really hungry for information. They tend to pay a little bit more. Um, so we thought, well, yeah, we could probably make something like that happen. It'd be worth our, our time and energy to do it. Plus, you know, who would want to go down under? So that one kind of fell by the wayside. But somewhere in that mix, I got introduced to Amanda Brax. And we started rapping on the phone, or on Skype, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I can make this happen. So she made it happen. You know, she got out there, got her contacts. She has... She's a very beloved um, person in the, the health club and the fitness industry in Australia. Um, she got, I don't know, that first year, you know, 150 people to come out and see us in an event in Sydney and uh, two days later in Melbourne. So we got these people to come out 
And then last year it was much bigger, you know, uh, a lot of the same faces coming back, you know, even though they had seen our presentations, the idea for Australia is, you know, just like let's say the fitness industry is a little slow whenever it comes to like adopting some technologies, like maybe, you know, they didn't start adopting autoresponders until three or four years after autoresponders became big and say the internet marketing community. Um, you know, mobile marketing started up a couple of years ago. Gym owners are just now starting to embrace the mobile marketing side of things. Australia is kind of the same way, whereas they're two or three years behind a lot of the things that we do. The trends that happen in our industry, we got to go over there and present to them more or less a crystal ball. They could look into that crystal ball that we present to them and see what's coming so they can prepare themselves. And I think that's kind of the allure. I mean, it was kind of positioned as you know, the Americans are coming. We've got to go and listen to what's happening there so that we can see what we need to be prepared for here in a few years. So Amanda Brax made it all happen. I give her all the credit. Okay. And the one thing we've been talking about is what you're doing to help build other businesses and how it's, you know, helped you. What do you do to bring in business for yourself? Like what are some of the marketing things that you do? Um, or is that trade secrets? <laughs> uh, no. Um, the big secret actually is that um, we don't, we're a marketing company that doesn't do a lot of marketing, as funny as that sounds. You know, we have certain systems in place, but, you know, I don't know, I mean, I know what it is that, that did it. I mean, we're very fortunate that we have a strong following. We have a good word of mouth in an industry that doesn't spread word of mouth. I mean, it's not like the gym owner is going to call up his buddy gym owner. And say you got to hire this group because they're probably the only ones that they know are in town. But you know, through conferences and speaking and the magazines and being close with vendors, word gets out. And whenever you're consistently delivering a quality message, that's really all that it takes. It doesn't matter. You know, this is a lesson for you know any fitness business owner also. Is if if you're doing a good job over delivering on content, on results, on fill in the blank. It doesn't matter what your postcard looks like. People are going to know who you are because the positive reputation that you've created for yourself. And fortunately, that's what we've done. You know, whenever I stepped back and I was able to kind of sit on this perch and uh, more or less grease the wheels that others are turning. While I'm greasing, you know, we're doing the TV show. We've got a newsletter that goes out several times a week. I rarely sell things, you know, so I'll send 100 emails to every one that I sell something. And I think that's the key is that you know, if I'm delivering this quality content over and over and over, information that helps these businesses, whenever it does come time for me to sell something, they're going to be like, I get all this great information they give away, I'm going to buy something, see what I can get, you know, from them if I actually purchase something. So it feels like um, in our world, we have what I call a spider web model. You know, in other industries, you know, they've got the wagon wheel and, you know, the funnel and you know reverse funnel and all the other things. Well, I kind of think of ours as a spider web. So at the center of the spider web, we've got the TV show, uh, we've got the newsletter, we've got the free portals into my world. And all we do, list build, list build, list build. Try to get more people on there so that we can help more people. Send out this good quality information that's going to help them for free. Then once they're in there long enough, they start thinking, oh, I'm going to go down this path a little bit. So they start moving up a thread of the spider web. So they land here. Then they buy, I don't know, they buy a gymsuccess.com membership. And then they can move forward and buy a more advanced gymsuccess.com membership, you know, as they experience that and they see that something's better over there. Or they can move down to the other leg of the spider web. And I keep it sticky, you know, just constantly good information, mm -hmm. just keeping them in there, you know, as many hooks as possible. But the thing is, you can't have a crap product, you know, you can't right. offer something that doesn't generate a return for them or, you know, it's just not going to work. So we try to make everything that we have generate more money for them than they than we ask them to invest. And then they see that, they make more money, and then they invest in the next thing. So this one worked great. I'm going to see what this one does. This one works great. I'm going to try this one. So we're creating everything around this hub right in the center of our spider web where we get them in as many people as possible. And then they just find their way out, out to the legs of, this, of, the, uh, of the web, if that makes sense. What's your lead in like what's your basic lead you talked about the TV show is that your number one like lead into your funnel um it's the most attractive um, okay. and that's been a nightmare in and of itself that was another one of those things where you learn your lesson outsourcing so the show hasn't been on now in four months which is good I needed a break but I had a short break before that it's time for the show <laughs> must go on at this yeah. point and I've gone through four video editors that you know one out of the country the, the lady who had done it for a year did a great job um, 
really impressed with everything. She ended up taking a position as a full-time professor doing graphic arts somewhere in um, in Indiana. Tried hiring somebody that she recommended. Uh, he kind of jerked me around for a month. That didn't work out. Tried to outsource it. I got jerked around another month. That didn't work. Somebody local in San Diego, that didn't work. And now I've got another guy, and I've just decided, you know, if, if this doesn't work, I'm just going to go old school, you know, YouTube style, which I don't really want to do because mm -hmm. I think there's some appeal in the videos that I put out that are professionally edited that isn't just me talking, which can get really boring. Um, so, um, yeah, I would say the TV show helps, but really... I think it's the newsletters. I mean, we're in the age where video is king. Obviously, that's why you know you're doing video now instead of just doing a transcript of this interview. Video is king, so the TV show definitely helps. The blog helps at at, at the TV show website, um, but the newsletter. I mean, people still read. People are still inspired by words, and whenever you write and you write and you write and become better at, at writing, people look forward to the words that you write. So, I feel like I've gotten to the point now where the information that I provide, I provide it in an entertaining enough fashion and I provide good enough information that they stick and they want to read it. And they read some more and they read some more and then I drop that PS where we're running a sale. Or um, I do a three-day launch on something and they've gotten content, content, content. Well, they're going to open these up and be like, I'm going to buy this. So, yeah, you're exactly right. Those, those, source, those two places, we just funnel them in as much as we can. Kind of like a gym would funnel people into uh, a trial membership mm -hmm. just to get them in the door. So all I want to do... So open up the door, let them come on in, then I'm going to show them everything I've got in my house after they come in. But you've got to get them in the door. Okay, now another thing I know is that you're a contributor and author to some pretty big publications. How did that come about? Well, that's another good question. Um, I've been doing this for so long now, I don't really know. Um, I'd like to say that they reached out to me because I am an incredible guy. But I don't think that that's the case. I have a feeling that if I look back, I probably approached them. Um, and, you know, that's another thing. You know, you never know what can come about if you just ask. You know, you, you make sales every day by asking for the sale. If you picture yourself and you want to write for a local magazine or a local newspaper or something, you just have to ask. So I'm sure there's some combination of me asking and then kind of developing, you know, a little bit of a, like a celebrity presence or an uh, uh, expert presence in that uh, periodical and then being invited to, to write for something else, and then volunteering to write for another thing. And um, yeah, I think, I think at this point it's just, it's invite only, but in the beginning I'm sure that I had to, uh, I had to beg a little bit. Okay. Now we're talking about uh, building businesses and how you help health clubs and, and gyms. Early on you talked about telemarketing, lead boxes being great ways to generate new leads and bring in clients. What are some of the best ways that you see that are coming up or that are working right now? Well, um, everything. The, the thing about marketing is that it's every single piece of marketing you put out, every, every type of marketing you have can be successful if it has the right tweaks. So, you know, when we start working with the gym and, and they have some horrible marketing, we're like, you know, we sent out this beautiful postcard and we didn't even get a, a phone call. Well, yeah, because the postcard, while it might be beautiful because it's glossy and, you know, has that exact same woman that's on every other gym postcard that gets sent out, you have no headline, you have no call to action, you have no scarcity tactic, you have no anything, there's just nothing there, no killer, you know, offer, tweak it just a little bit and it'll work. Lead boxes, they're dead. They aren't dead if you tweak the offer on them a little bit, if you just, just a little something and constantly test and retest. Every marketing strategy can be... A, a good one. So what's working today is not necessarily one strategy in particular. It's, you know, because there's no home runs left in marketing. People have seen everything. They're inundated with over 3,000 ad messages per day, every single person. It's going to be hard to break through. So it's not about trying to do one particular marketing strategy and hitting it out of the park. It's about hitting single after single after single after single because when it comes down to it, I don't know any single strategy that's going to generate 100 new clients or members for you. But I do know 100 strategies that if each are implemented, will each be good for one new client or member. And I think that's the name of the game right now. But when you talk specifics, obviously, you know, we've got that new mobile marketing software. So, you know, I'm going to I'm going to pump that up a little bit since you're giving me the, uh, the lead in here. 
mobile marketing is doing a really good job. It's only been launched three months. We knew it was going to be killer. Uh, text message marketing works in every other industry. Why it took so long to get to the fitness industry, I don't really know. But we created the the, uh, the Fit Messenger program, and it's working like crazy. We were at the uh, boot camp boot camp event held by Pat Rigsby and uh, Nick Berry this past week, and I had people coming up to me thanking me just in the month that they've had the system. Uh, one of the guys showed me his phone. They put up one of our Facebook widgets that comes with the software on their Facebook fan page, directed their Facebook advertising to it. He's like scrolling through his BlackBerry, just lead after lead after lead, the cell phone numbers of all these people that have opted in that he has to call back, just dozens of them, and he had just implemented it the week before. Uh, another guy, he's, he's at the end of his boot camp program. He's having everybody come in a circle, bring their phones. He's never allowed phones in before, but now he's forcing them to come and bring their phones, and he brings a bucket of water, and he says, you have to text one person that uh, they can come and, and join you for boot camp right now, and you can have your water. And, of course, they're, like, sweating. They're dying, you know, and they want that water so bad. So right. he's just using it as a total engine then. So the mobile marketing is, is working really well right now. Okay. And to be honest with you, dollar for dollar, the best lead gen tool that we've used, and luckily, like I said before, it was a surprise, best marketing tool that we've seen, hands down, is that using the gift cards, you know, no real value loaded on it, but it looks like there's real value on it. It's the um, the fake mag stripe on the back. You can give it out all over the place. You put a hundred dollar price tag on it, which is the equivalent of maybe your enrollment fee. So instead of promoting on a postcard that you spend four thousand dollars on, saying no enrollment fee, distribute as many of these gift cards as possible. Because I mean, I've got a Bed Bath and Beyond gift card in my truck, and I'm never going to use it. I mean, I'm not a Bed Bath and Beyond kind of guy. So, but I can't throw it away because it has $40 on it, right? Right. Somebody will use it at some point. I cannot throw this thing away. Well, it's the same thing. The people who receive these gift cards, they have no idea that it's not truly loaded with that value on it, and they will not throw it away. It goes in their wallet. Even if they don't use it right away, it's going to stay there, or they're going to give it to somebody else. I can't use this $100, but you should. You know, so it's, it's become one of the, the best marketing tools that we've had, especially for generating those referrals, which is obviously the lifeblood of most fitness businesses. When you give out the gift cards, is there anything you do to try and get those people to use them right away? Because you said sometimes they do sit around, and I know in my case, early on, I would just hand them out without any try, you know, incentive for them to use it right mm -hmm. away. So is there anything sure. that you say to use, get them to use it quicker? Um, well, sometimes it's difficult to. I mean, if you're at the point of sale and you give it to somebody, you have their contact information. So you can call them and remind them to give out the gift cards. I haven't seen the gift card from that. Interestingly... We've done, I like compound marketing strategies where you, you touch people in multiple different ways, you know, with different types of marketing strategies. So we have, um, we'll use the Fit Messenger program combined with the gift card program. So on the back of your gift card in fine print, we'll say, you know, text 123Fitness uh, to 70000 to receive a super secret special offer. So they already have the $100 gift card. So that super special secret offer that they text in, it immediately pops up on their phone and it says, uh, here's your super secret special, say that 10 times fast, offer, uh, it's another $100. Or it's two, your first month free on top of your $100 right. if you come and join by Friday or if you come and join within the next seven days. So we've used that to combine the two. But oftentimes, you know, it just ends up being a waiting game or the, uh, the follow-up system that you have in place at the gym to remind people to to bring it in. Now we also have another system where we use the gift cards uh, called our reaction program where we will take, the gym will have like a trifold letter, those little blue dots that um, are on the back of credit cards whenever you get a new credit card in the mail. Mm -hmm. Affix a gift card to that right out. You know, we've got the script and the templates for it. Um, they just personalize it and then it'll say, you know, here's a gift card for you to use toward renewal of your membership. Or if it's an expired member, somebody hasn't been there in three months or a year, to get them to rejoin. Um, and then in the uh, sales copy, you'll tell them uh, this has to be activated by the end of the month or something similar to people. And that's, so there that's, are some ways. that's a good one because I was, you know, I, I did something similar. I actually just used some rubber cement, slapped it on there, mailed it to a couple of clients, and that seemed to work. So that's a, a pretty solid sure. one. Um, some of the other online products that you have, what what are those? You talk about Fit Messenger. You know, I know you have um, a couple of membership sites, but what are you doing as you know as a funnel and other things to help gyms and clubs? Um, well, our most popular online resource is GymSuccess.com. It caters primarily to gyms, not to studios or boot camp operators. 
Um, we've got 1,500 clients in there. Some just come in naturally uh, and sign up, and then others are subsidized by various companies in the industry for their health club clients. So they get a discounted rate, and then they pay for it as a value add. You know, we have complimentary Gym Success membership for doing business with us, or you know, as a retention tool for to keep their clients longer, also. So um, that's a big one. It's a resource center full of all kinds of templates and scripts and articles and marketing strategies and uh, spreadsheets. I mean, everything a gym would need. It's kind of like a, there's actually not a lot of organization to it other than the categories. Mm -hmm. It's just the hodgepodge of absolutely everything that you could possibly ever need to run your business. Um, okay. So there's, you know, there's gym success. Um, we've well, got a couple me, others. Let me Go ask ahead. you this real quick. Um, you talked about, you know, it's fo you're focused obviously on health clubs and gyms. But why not ever dive into the boot camp business or, you know, maybe a smaller personal training type of model? Sure. Um, we do have some crossover appeal uh, yeah. on purpose because, you know, I've always been gyms and health clubs. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's a that's a niche, right? And right. fitness industry as a whole is a niche. And then I just take that really small niche within the niche. Now, I'm also leaving, you know, a lot of people out there that high and dry that could be benefiting from the products that we have. Uh, and obviously money on the table for us by not diving into that side of the industry. So we do have some products that have some crossover appeal, like the, the Fit Messenger and the Fit Gift Cards, Fitness mm -hmm. Gift Cards and things like that. So we do have some crossover. We have some affiliates in that industry. But to be honest with you, that industry, the personal training at boot camp, there are enough gurus in that industry. It is loaded with gurus and wannabe gurus and people that should never even use the word guru and their name in the same sentence. So I'm happy being the the guy on the health club, uh, and you know, becoming more of a fitness marketing guy on the personal training and the boot camp side. You know, I don't know everything that goes into the operations at a boot camp or a studio like I would at a gym, but I I do know how those businesses can do a better job of marketing. So if I'm doing anything, I'm just positioning myself as a, uh, a good source of marketing information and marketing strategies for those industries. But that market is, is already saturated with uh, too right. many smart people. So, Okay. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm big with video. This is why I decided to do this. And you have this, the, the website, fitbiz.tv. What was the idea for that? Like, why did you decide to do that? Well, probably the same reason you decided to do this. You know, video is attractive. It's a, it's a really engaging way to get people involved because there are some people that like to read. There are some people that like to listen. And then there's more people that would rather just kick back and watch a video like they're doing right now. So when I started it, I didn't want just the, the YouTube talking head, me just sitting there for 15 minutes by myself with no interaction, nothing else happening. Um, no split screen and back and forth like we have here. It'd just be me. And that's, I would not want to subject anybody to 15 minutes of me just sitting there talking to you, you know, without any interruption. So anybody can make a YouTube video, right? Not everybody has the resources to be able to make something a little sexy or more dynamic. So I got turned on to, um, who's now become a really good friend of mine, Andrew Locke, uh, at a Ryan Lee bootcamp event several years ago. So. Um, and I say Andrew is a really good friend of mine. It's only because I pay him to be a really good friend of mine. So, you know, I'm in his mastermind group paying for mentoring, but he really become a good friend. But yeah. he's the one that encouraged me to go with the web TV because he has that really popular online uh, TV show, Help My Business Sucks. And it's all done, you know, it's professionally done. And he, uh, that's why I started working with him was let him guide that process and make sure that I do it right instead of making a lot of mistakes. And it worked out beautifully. Um, you know, the show is really popular. Um, I don't know whether people like it because, you know, I'm being hunted by abominable snowmen or kicking black cats off the screen or, you know, getting caught picking my nose. I mean, there's all kinds of weird things. You never know what's going to happen. There's always something. I mean, right. I have fire forming in my hand in, in an episode. So <laughs> the editing you know, okay. makes it fun and, you know, keeps it, keeps it changing a little bit. And then we have different segments because if I were to sit there and talk to you for 15 minutes about one thing, your eyes are going to glaze over. Even if it's right. amazing information, right. it's you know, if somebody doesn't like what I'm talking about at that moment, it's okay because in two or three minutes, I'm going to switch topics and go to something else. So I'm going to give them a good nugget of information in every segment for something that they can take away. And then obviously we have sponsor spots so we can promote our vendors and friends and our own mm -hmm. stuff along the way as well. But uh, it all came about because it was a gap in the industry, just like everything else we create. And I'm a gap filler. 
Um, and to be honest with you, I'm not uh, a, a person that likes to be in the limelight. Uh, most of my friends and family would say that's not true, but I'm just as happy hiding behind the curtain, helping a bunch of people, making my income and calling it a day. But in the health club industry especially, you know, a lot of the people who are the gurus of the industry are the founding fathers and mothers of the industry. It's the good old boy network and they're, they're still in it, but they're ready to retire, you know, and there's not been very many people. I could count a number of people on less than the fingers on one hand of people who are stepping up to take the place in the, in the gym industry uh, for these guys that are going out. So I thought, you know, why waste a face like this? You know, I've got to go out there and become a face, if not the face, of the industry. And that was just two years ago, and you know, we've done a pretty incredible job uh, positioning me and branding me. As much as I was against it, I was convinced otherwise, just due to you know the necessity in the industry and the people who are in my in my circle. So that's why the TV show came about. All right, real busy. You've got so many things going on. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're doing that. You're consulting. Just take me through what a typical day is like for you. Typical day. So I uh, will uh, I'll sleep till around noon. Um, I'll play with the dog until around three. Uh, I'll probably eat something, you know, in between there. Uh, and I like to sleep, so I'm normally in bed by seven. Watch a few movies. And that's that's pretty much it. And today I'm doing the interview with you. That's all so, you did today was now, just um, the interview, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. I mean, I still have sleep in my eye right now. Um, that's, a, that's a nice no, day. <laughs> yeah. See. Here comes the challenge with me. Um, you know, I have not been diagnosed, but I'm pretty certain that I have ADD. So, Don't we all, yeah. yeah. So, my mind can't wrap around one thing for very long. So, luckily, I was smart enough to know that I can't. I'm not a good finisher. I'm I'm very creative, and I can build things up, and then I can kind of grease it after the fact. But to take something and run with one thing all the way until it's complete, I just don't have that, that, that mental capacity to do that. So a typical day for me is assisting the people who I have put in the places to do the job that either I don't like to do or that I'm unable to do. So I will, I mean, I'm still dealing with a million emails that come in every day. I'd like to somehow, you know, whittle that away at some point. But I've gotten pretty good about, you know, having a system where I'll, I'll check email um, I'll do something initially in the day to stimulate my mind. Uh, and right now I'm on a Scrabble kick. I have Scrabble on my phone. It's like like something just to get your mind going. You know, sometimes I'll read, sometimes, right. you know, I'll do something. I rarely ever watch TV. Um, but something to kind of get my mind going in the morning. Um, eat my breakfast. You know, it's the most, most important meal of the day. And then I jump right into some emails. And that's, a lot of people say you shouldn't do email right away. I do. You know, I just, I at least knock out a good portion of them. I'll start the ones that I want to get back to later. Uh, so I either delete it or I'll assign it for, for later or I'll delegate it on and send it on if it's more mm -hmm. suitable for somebody else. So I'll check email three times a day and I'll spend uh, no more than two hours total on email a day. Um, in any given day I do a lot of writing. Um, writing a, a, a book right now, another book um, that I can't tell you anything about. But writing that and then the articles for the magazines, um, various videos, uh, articles for Gym Success, a lot of writing. And then um, a lot of networking, you know, any given day, you know, I'll pick up the phone if I'm working on a project with a, a new person or we've got a new affiliate for one of the products, I'll spend an hour of time on the phone with them. So every day is completely different, but it's the only way that I want it to be. I, I live in like a structured chaos in my day. I know what my next day is going to hold for the most part but something always comes up. So I always have, you know, my three major things that I want to get done every single day and to make sure that they're done. And then if there's interruptions or other things going on, it's okay because I got the main things out of the way. But a lot of writing, a lot of time on the phone, and then I do a lot of research. So, you know, I'll buy, I do a lot of time looking at other industries rather than just focusing on ours. And I will, um, I'll buy a lot of products, info products, books, magazines, uh, fill in the blank, and I do a lot of reading do a lot of researching and I do a lot of note taking. I'll do a lot of taking that idea and then turning it into something that's usable for the fitness industry. So instead of rehashing, and I think that's what a lot of people like my style is that I'm not doing the same stuff over and over and just rehashing something that's already been done. I'm peeling things from other industries and then incorporating them into ours. So in almost everything that I write, 
the idea is nothing unique. I don't come up with a lot of my ideas. There's no unique ideas, right? But I am taking ideas from other smart people and then implementing them and sharing them with the industry that I am a part of. Very cool. All right, we're going to wrap up now, and I always like to end with you know a few quick fire questions. I want to know um, what have some of your biggest failures been? What'd you learn from them? I don't fail, Eric. Next question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, uh, gosh, I don't. Uh, I don't know what would be considered a failure, um, mm -hmm. because if I do fail, I'm just the type of person I've gotten to where you know I'm too old and I like my life too much that if something isn't working, it's gone and I leave it behind and I don't even think about it. So I guess there's a lesson there. If I do fail, it's it's already in my rearview mirror before it even begins to to latch onto my back. A lot of people carry things with them far too long. I mean, that, that kind of leads into the next question. What is it that's made you successful? What has made me successful? Um, well, this is rapid fire, so I should have a faster answer. Yeah, it's, it's, I did it that way. It's rapid fire, but to make you think. Sure. Um, well, what made me successful, and I guess this digs probably deeper than a lot of people want to go, um, is, you know, I mentioned it earlier, touched on it. I didn't grow up with a whole lot. You know, um, my father raised us for many years on his own, and even whenever my stepmom came in, and she was a great woman, I hated her at the time. But love her now. She's my best friend. Uh, we're actually going to Europe next week together. So, um, so I didn't have a lot. And the things that I did have only came because my father is the hardest working person that I've ever known in my entire life. He's worked in a blue collar in a factory doing ball bearing work, heat treating, a heat treating plant for probably almost 40 years now. Um, he's needs to retire very soon. He's at the point where he can, so I'm hoping I've got my fingers crossed that he can. But he hated his life, still does not enjoy his life. You know, he's built up a lot of anxiety. He's worried his entire life, and it all stems from, you know, when my mom passed, and, you know, I remember him telling a story where, you know, my, my mother's parents were driving away after all the funeral and everything happened, and, um, you know, all the excitement of everything and everybody coming in and, you know, a week of just stuff going on. It never really sunk in what had happened. And then all of a sudden they turn the corner and, you know, he's holding my hand and he's holding my little brother, my two-year-old brother in his arm. And all of a sudden it just hits him. And you can just tell whenever he, he told me that story that that was the moment that his life changed. You know, it's no more footloose and fancy free. It's no more, you know, I'll be the... Um, I'll provide, I'll put food on the table. You take care of the kids. You know, I, I think we were probably both oops babies, to be honest with you. But now he's got real responsibilities. And that was the moment that probably triggered everything. You know, I have to work. I have to have a babysitter. I don't like my job, but I have to work. I have to kill myself doing overtime. And so I watched this progression over the years, you know, and when I was a kid, you don't really see it. But as you, as you get older and you see it, and even now it's just, man, you just see, my father has taught me a lot of lessons in life, and he will be proud to know that the biggest lesson he ever taught me is to not be like him in that regard. I don't want to be anxiety ridden. I don't want to worry where, you know, the next dollar is going to come from or, you know, have to kill myself to absolutely or to, to get that next dollar. Uh, I want to enjoy my life. I don't want to hate my job, and I don't want to have to worry about money. So I think that, you know, a lot of people put that that picture of what they want, you know, on their vision board or in their head, and then they they take those steps to get to that point. I think my motivation and my success comes from the fact that I see where I don't want to go, and I want to be what my father wanted me to be, and that pushes me on to be more and more successful. So there's my feel-good answer for you. Um, hope that works. That was great. I think we'll leave it leave it at that. So just want to know some information and people want to find out more about you and what you're doing, where can they go? Um, yeah, um, there's a lot of places, but um, the best place is just go to fitnessbusinesstelevision.com. Um, you can sign up there. You can watch a bunch of episodes, and then I'll tell you when a new episode's out. Uh, that'll also put you on my newsletter list, and I'll send stuff out. Um, there's an unsubscribe link in every email, so if you end up hating me, just click, click a button, and uh, you'll never have to talk to me again. So uh, once you get in there, you'll see everything else I have going on. The, um, the new software is at fitmessenger.com, you can check it out, gymsuccess.com, and a million others you'll learn about once you uh, you start getting into my world. Very cool. Curtis, thanks so much for being on. I really appreciate the time and all the uh, 
awesome tips that you shared with us. You bet, Eric. <laughs>